and we're off and running. Welcome back to Watch Tonight on Watchbox Studios. I'm your host, Tim Masso. Tonight, we're talking about the difference between collectible watches and investment grade watches. They can be the same, but not necessarily. We're talking about recent wristwatch theft and mugging trends. This should be topical for all of us. Plus the good, the bad, and the ugly at IWC Schaffhausen. All of that plus I'm sharing your viewer wrist chats right here on Watches Tonight. Of course, the folks who pay for the pixels, thewatchbox.com, the wonder of the internet. You can open up another window, keep me streaming, and check out the best place to buy, trade, or sell watches 24 hours a day and globally. We are in Neuchatel, Switzerland. We are in South Africa. We are now in Singapore and Hong Kong. And I recommend everyone who is in Singapore, if you're not dealing with Patek Philippe withdrawal symptoms, check out our Singapore office. There will be full contact details in the description of this video. Join me on Instagram, my other medium, where you can see my 60 second quick format videos with over 600 now posted. You can literally binge watch my Instagram, updating daily. I could see friends joining in from around the world. Monkey Sea Production from Chicago. We've got Edward Ledden of Sweden. We've got Omegatron asking about Geo's new dive watch. Well, I've got reviews already up on Watchbox Reviews, so be sure to check that. Daniel Chapman. We've got Salty Boy from Texas. Michael Gerard. We have Russell996, Blue Shirt Buddha. Jim Branch, True Live from Canada. The Provincial Gentry. Felipe Zapata from St. Augustine, Florida. Richard K. Eric Nielsen, Logan Hall. We've got Neo. Looking forward to Matrix 4, Neo. And finally, we've got Akshay, New York City from my old home state. All right, guys, rolling along into the program, your wrist chats. Joe R, first and foremost, with a brand I love, the undervalued and underloved ball. Here with the Engineer Master 2 Diver featuring lovely array of tritium tracers on its dial, so you need not energize it before it glows. We have James B. in his stunning vintage Zenith collection. A Philly local, he's stealing the show. I could stop right here. That is as good as Zenith gets, and you can see where the modern DeFi case shape comes from. We've got Gordy C. of Glasgow, Lights up the sky with his Glasuta Original Panamatic Lunar, an Aggie 88 of Texas, and his Grand Seiko SBGR019 behind the wheel of his Subaru Crosstrek. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watches on this box. Jumping into the bear, I see Bear Clooney watches. We've got David Slavin from Richmond, Texas, Eric Cecil, Derek P from Los Angeles, Marco's joining in, Daniel Chapman, still waiting for my Scottish Watches podcast. I need to get that done. The guy is super friendly and helpful. I need to make that happen. That is on my to-do list for the week. We've got Mez944. We've got Mark Tukey. We've got Eddie Landsberg, Steve Boat. Maybe it's Mark Tucci. Sorry about that. And we have Eddie Landsberg, occasional studio audience. All right, Ryan asks, what is the difference between collectibles and investment watches? This is a good question because sometimes they can be one and the same, but they usually are not because there are a lot more collectibles than there are investments. A quick review of one interpretation of these terms. An investment needs to be classed for our purposes as something that generates more wealth than the cost of acquisition and maintenance and upkeep. So at the end, whatever you spend to buy and then maintain, needs to be less than ultimately what you get as a return, whether that's from selling, whether it's just living long enough to make the most of your annuity and come out ahead, you have to wind up with more when all is said and done. So in the case of a car, we'll use this parallel, a 1967 Maserati Ghibli, one of the most beautiful cars ever made, but through the late 90s and early 2000s, not one of the most expensive collectibles you could find. If you bought that car for $40,000 in 2002, let's assume we're talking about a 4.7 liter, that was very possible. That counts as a decent investment, since even with insurance, maintenance, inflation of the original value of that 40,000 and upkeep, you're probably still not going to outweigh the $170,000 roughly that you would have gained in appreciation value on that Maserati. But now we're talking about another one of my favorites, a 1967 Oldsmobile bought for say $12,000 back in 2002 is probably still worth about $12,000. It's a historically important car. It's a landmark design. In its way, it's actually more relevant to the engineering of the cars we drive today than the Maserati. But while not an investment by any definition, you will have put money into this ownership experience, it is a collectible. And it's a collectible because it has a permanent fan community online and off. You'll be welcome at any car club meet. It has 
historic importance that is widely recognized. It is a landmark car, and it features certain engineering refinements that make it a milestone. It's not just a great design. Inside and out, this the car was special. And there is a constant marketplace to buy, trade, and sell these between people who find it to be special and collectible. They will collect it even if their collection includes only one collectible car. So let's talk about watches now. It's true, a 1964 Paul Newman Rolex 6239 will have made you a fortune if you purchased that back in 2002 when a watch like that could be bought for $20,000. Today that watch is worth as much as a fine house and depending on who owned the watch previously and how well it's documented it might be worth as much as a fine island. But you can find a 1960s Rolex 5512 Submariner for less than 10 grand on a strap. And while you might have made some money if you bought it in 2002 for, let's say, four and a half thousand dollars, remember today, the equivalent purchasing power of that four and a half grand US dollars, it's gonna be over six thousand dollars. So it's not a four and a half grand watch. With today's money, it's over six grand. You will have serviced that watch probably four times at a couple hundred dollars a pop. Let's say you've got a nice independent watchmaker, he's doing it for five or six hundred dollars each time for you. Vintage will cost more, especially if he needs to find parts. There's going to be the cost of insuring it because most collectors who have collectibles do realize that beyond a few watches they've got some sort of liability that needs to be protected so at the end of the day depending on inflation what your original investment investment was worth and how much you've spent maintaining the watch you might be just breaking even if that's now an eight thousand seven thousand five hundred dollar watch so let's Again, just recap, permanent fan community online and off. You will always find friends and fellows who are into these watches. Recognition of historic importance. The 5512 was the first Submariner with crown guards. That's kind of a big deal. Uh, features that make the watch important or memorable. Many different dial variations. Do you, uh, do you want squared off crown guards? Do you want pointy guards? Do you want a Bart Simpson on the dial? There are a lot of different ways we can break up the production of 5512s and make them special, even if in all cases they're not necessarily worth more. And then finally, a constant marketplace to buy, trade, and sell these watches where you can find people who want to take on that collectible, even if they don't necessarily want to enrich you for the privilege of doing so. Jumping into the box right here, we've got Dave Opencar joining, saying good evening, watch fans. Zin right here, Zin right here. We've got Akshay, New York City. Tim, in your opinion, what is the best open-worked watch under $3,000 new or used? Well, I would have to say that the new Bell & Ross BR05 used is probably going to be right around that price range. I would also say that there's there's quite a few watches from Parallel that you can buy right around that price range. They might have a turbine on the dial, they might be open, but they're definitely in that range. I think you can also find a number of clerk watches that have interesting open dials for between three and 4,000. And remember, at the end of the day, when you buy a skeleton dial for under $3,000, you're either getting something that's very, very unusual and very, very old, or you're getting a dial that was originally machined open. If you want a real hand skeletonized dial where someone took basic hand tools opened up the dial, preserved the mechanical functionality of the bridges, and then finished the whole thing, there's really no way to get off cheap. I would say probably the best way to get something like that would be for under 10 grand, buy an old pre-in-house movement, that is pre-2009 Armin Strom watch with an ETA 2824, 2892, uh, Unitas 6497, or Valju 7750. That would be the best buy in real hand skeletonized I would say open dial or open worked dial watches. You can also find a few really nice uh, Kurt Schaffo uh, skeletonized Zenith pieces from the 90s that you should also be able to pick up for under $10,000. And that's gonna be my earnest recommendation. Don't try to do it for under 3K if you really want something handmade. Focus under 10 and then see if you can get it under nine or eight. You've got options, but you're gonna have to search because hand skeletonized means rare. Okay. Viewer wrist shots, Russell K of the UK and his 40th anniversary Patek Philippe Nautilus. Enjoy Rome from above. That's a great shot, by the way, Russell. You always surprise me. Rex P of Hong Kong shares his Patek Philippe 5961A that he bought at Watchbox Hong Kong. Newsflash, guys, we're open for business in Hong Kong and Singapore. For more info about Singapore, links and leads in the description. 
Tamim A of Bahrain sports his water wings poolside in his building with a Breitling Chronomat Airborne 41, and he clarified it's not his building, but it is his watch. Raphael C of Singapore frames the legendary Marina Bay Sands, the three towers and the sculpted integrated resort in the background with his Rolex GMT Master 2 Green GMT hand. Guys, I love it. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. Jump into the box real quick. Blue Shirt Buddha, Tim. Is a Breguet Type 20 a good high horology buy? I would say as time has gone on, the Type 20 has been more attractively finished, but for the most part, you're gonna find that the Type 20s have very workmanlike Lemagna calibers based on the Lemagna 1340, 1350 families. So while the watches may be handmade, especially on the dial, to an extent that you won't find with, say, an Omega Speedmaster or Planet Ocean Chronograph, a Type 20 in general is not going to be a highly hand-finished high horology watch. If you're looking for that, you should be looking at something like the 50th anniversary Omega Speedmaster, which was an extraordinary partially hand-finished display case back with, I believe, an enamel dial, a limited edition, and a very cool sapphire sand uh, s sandwich array. It was probably the most appealing Speedmaster limited edition of which I can recall. Definitely before checking out the Platinum caliber 321 this year. Check out the 50th anniversary from 2007. And then right here we have Kenneth Sham saying, Tim, IWC Pilot Mark 18 Heritage or Oris Big Crown Pro Pilot Date. Considering the running gear for these two watches is going to be very similar, I would recommend you go for the Oris because you will have more dial options, some of which are quite sexy and invariably priced a lot less than the similarly Salida powered IWC Mark 18s. Uh, the Spitfire is now an in-house caliber, but a lot of the Mark 18s are still going to be a Salida base. And then right here we have B and M asking, Tim, what entry level brand stands above the rest and its price? Well, entry-level brand is awfully difficult to, to, I would say, pigeonhole, because a lot of times I talk about $3,000 watches and people ask, why don't you talk about $30 watches and $300 watches? Realistically, if you want an entry-level watch, something that I would consider a watch under $5,000, I think the best thing you can do is get a true luxury watch that is a seven dollars to $12,000 watch that is depreciated below $5,000. And you will be able to find Zenith in that range. You will be able to get El Primeros for $3,000, especially if you're looking at one of the non-flyback rainbows from the 1990s. I've seen DeLucas for under four grand, and those are truly rare watches. I would say realistically, if you're talking about strictly entry-level brands. I do like the Clifton Balmatic Chronometer. I think it's a very hot watch. I like the gradient blue dial from Balm & Mercier that came out this year. You're getting a hell of a lot of movement for the money and a very wearable size. I would also say that realistically, there are a lot of Zinn and Damasco watches for under $5,000 that represent a tremendous amount of honest value for what you pay, especially with Zinn. If you're buying factory direct, you're not paying for a middleman markup. And then it's also worth mentioning that there's still a hell of a lot of Bell & Ross watches that are very very honestly Salida powered. And I think for what you're getting, it's not a bad deal, but as always, pre-owned is gonna be more honest and closer to true value. So all those are important. And I think some of the entry level Bremont watches, some of their bigger pieces and their complicated pieces and their in-house pieces are priced rather dear. But if you're looking at something like the Airco, I think that's a great collection of watches for very little luxury watch money. And they're all chronometer certified and 100 meters water resistant. So all of that is worthy and worthwhile. Jumping back into our topics, watch theft. It's back, guys. Uh, here in the US, we had a spate from the 1970s through early 90s of just epidemic violent street crime. And we've sort of got that under control as a nation, not perfect, but better. However, internationally, there is an emerging trend in watch theft and watch muggings uh, that's rather disturbing, but also consistent enough that I think it's worth mentioning, although mugging has been around virtually forever, and sometimes, as with this Victorian lady here, the mugged comes out ahead. Nevertheless, we are seeing a phenomenon that first came to light for me in an article I read in the LA Times in late 2016 that two men were robbed of $100,000 worth of watches on the main luxury shopping drag in LA, Rodeo Drive. Now, this was unusual because the thieves quite literally went to a target-rich environment right on the main strip outside the boutiques. They managed to walk away with six figures. Now, 
here's the thing, this is now global. Rolex obviously is where this starts because anyone looking to rob someone of a valuable watch immediately recognizes almost every Rolex model and the Rolex name. But that's where it starts, not where it ends. The world's foremost curbside caper target Aside, watch theft has expanded into true high horology, not by accident, just because people were in the wrong place at the wrong time, but thieves are getting smart, realizing that bagging one really big piece could be the equivalent of bagging 20 omegas. Last week, a Japanese man in Paris stepped out to smoke a cigarette outside the Hotel Napoleon, which is in a posh accommodation district just off the Champs Elysees, which is Paris's version of Rodeo Drive, or rather, Rodeo is LA's version of the Champs Elysees. But the point is, a man approached, asked for a cigarette, and when this Japanese gentleman pulled out the cigarette and revealed what was on his wrist, the thief absconded with the man's $830,000 Richard Mille Tourbillon Diamond Twister. Yes, he probably should have known better. But again, it happened right in front of his luxury hotel, clearly because a guy was targeting exactly that kind of watch from exactly that kind of owner in exactly that spot. And here's the thing, as of August 2019, that is not even October, but August, CNN reported 71 specific reports of luxury watch muggings in Paris and four individual muggings on just one day in that period netted almost 200,000 euro worth of value. And that's not an accident, that's by design. And that isn't even, by the way, guys, that isn't even the most expensive Richard Mille mugging of the year, not even close, 830 grand, a thief in Spain earlier ripped off a $1.3 million Richard Mille McLaren Torbion. And well, true, they want to make the point that the thief might have trouble selling it, but if he dumps it for a hundred grand, he still did all right for a day's work. My point right here is that this is virtually a new class of crime, ultra high-end watch theft and muggings. Separately, London has recognized this. London has begun explicitly advertising. Can we go full screen there? advertising a new class of crime. That's not far from Piccadilly. And right there, you could see they understand the lay of the land. And while you might not expect that on a visit to London, we now have to expect it when traveling abroad, especially in areas where we are not familiar. Major Brazilian cities, and this has been recounted endlessly on online fora and even travel websites, have been considered too risky for high visibility watches for quite some time. When you add Europe and increasingly the United States to that list, you start to realize that this is a global trend. The United States, of course, isn't immune to pilfered pieces, but methods have differed somewhat, at least to this point. There's not quite as much mugging on the street. Like I said, we sorta got that under control, but we have seen a rash of smash and grab and smash and dash boutique robberies. It's happened everywhere from Tourneau to Cartier to Jager Le Coult in New York City, my old neck of the woods. And we've also seen thieves targeting soft, targets. This is one case of men who were stealing watches from basically unlocked gym lockers at high-end high -end sports clubs and gymnasiums in New York City. Um, you're also seeing targeting of unlocked cars, of empty and unlocked houses. So this is now a phenomenon. I think I can give some basic guidance on what to do. First, never leave your watches unlocked. Whether they're in your car or in your house, in the house, put them in the safe. Or better yet, put them in the safety deposit box because I've heard reliable stories of incidents where a thief doesn't necessarily need to have the combination to the lock, just access to you to force the issue. And of course, if you're gonna stay with a watch at a hotel or a gym, really put a lock on it. Also, scout the terrain, do your research in advance. I know that I speak to friends, a family, associates in areas to be visited where I'm just not familiar with the town or the neighborhood. It pays to look ahead. And a lot of times on watch forum, you ask and they'll tell. Also important, daylight is safer than dark, indoors safer than outdoors. And while this seems obvious, it's, it's true and it bears repetition because the Parisian Richard Mille Tourbillon diamond twister theft occurred at 9 p.m. just outside of a hotel. Harder to pull it off in daylight, riskier, not impossible, certainly it's happened, but in the dark by yourself, don't take chances, especially when you're outdoors in an unfamiliar city. And I should mention, 
that both the Japanese gentleman robbed in Paris and the Azerbaijani man robbed in Ibiza, Spain, were both from out of town and didn't know what to expect. If they'd looked ahead and done a bit of research on the watch for a, they'd probably have known that there was an existing issue that was well known and often relayed to travelers. So when in doubt, travel without expensive watches. That's my ultimate advice. When I walk through places, even in Philadelphia, that I don't know, I don't even wear a $3,000, $4,000 watch because it's, it's just not worth the risk. At the end of the day, you're asking for trouble if you take an expensive thing where it might get ripped off. If people steal my wallet, if people steal my cars, I'll live. If they steal my watch, that's like taking a piece of me. Uh, so at the end of the day, just do your homework, better safe than sorry, lock it up, and when in doubt, whip out the G-Shock. All right, jumping into the box right here, we have all sorts of comments varying from references to using a firearm to simply wearing a Timex when on the lamb when out in unfamiliar cities and areas. And then I can see right here, we've got ID guys saying, just wear unrecognizable timepieces. Simple. It's true. Something along the lines of an Acrivia Chronomet Contemporane would probably never get ripped in a place where every Rolex is going to get lift lifted. But why take the chance? Thieves are increasingly literate and sophisticated. They might be in this live chat too. And then right here, I can see we've got Ahmad A saying, never take watches overseas. And then Ryan Bass saying, hey Tim, huge fan, just relocated to Paris for the year and it seems I tuned in at the perfect time. I'll keep the BLNR in the watch box or at the very least out in broad daylight. I've also seen right here, uh, Flip and Zippo saying, I would be happy to trade a Speedmaster for a bag of meth, just saying. That's an individual decision. I can't claim that one is a better investment than the other, but we've already been past that in this episode. So hopefully you studied up. And and then right here, we've got High and Rising saying, if you're gonna wear a $1.3 million watch, you'd better be a billionaire. That's true. If you're really that rich, you should have another one on your ankle so you can immediately replenish when your first one gets bagged. All right, and then right here, we have Akshay New York City saying, Tim, value-wise, what is a better investment, the Omega Blue Side of the Moon Aventurine dial or the Seamaster 300 James Bond 50th anniversary that was released recently? I'm gonna say buy in the blue side, Aventurine, pre-owned, cause that's a very expensive watch. You're well into five figures with that timepiece. It is rare, and I would bet money that there will be fewer of those out and about than almost any Omega. James Bond limited edition, which tend to be like 15,000, 7,007, 15,007. Yes, I get the 007 millisimation, but those that's basically unlimited. That's as many as they can sell. So buy the expensive and unusual watch, buy it depreciated, and you've easily got a more collectible and undoubtedly more exclusive watch than any James Bond limited. Plus, On Her Majesty's Secret Service is not a great Bond film. And if you're gonna buy a watch that's either the namesake or co-branded product of a specific Bond movie, make it one of the great ones, not one of the forgettable ones, and especially not the one with George Lass and be in it. All right, jumping back into the box. I have a comment. I bought an Automore for 200. You either got a hell of a deal or, well, never mind. And then right here, Kevin S. Casio Oak for travel. Or, since we all know it exists, the Bull of a Royal Oak. There we go. That's the compromise. Jumping back into the topic, we've got, well, let's answer a question from Daniel Gianetti. Tim, do you think the Tudor market is dying down? Yes. You can't just endlessly iterate one class of watch forever. When you've seen Tudor try to expand into other vintage references like the Ranger or the North Flag, it hasn't had the bite and the penetration into the market that you saw with the Black Bay. So while the Black Bay remains a strong play, they do depreciate, there are a lot of them, and Tudor is making more. So cool watches, but I do feel like the moment has passed. If like the hotbed of vintage Hoyer was 2013, 14, and 15, and now we're kind of in the aftermath, I feel like we are in the last 15 minutes of the Tudor craze. Great watches, but if you think they will be endlessly hot, you're banking on Tudor coming up with the next big thing. Whereas the Black Bay debuted back in 2012 and it's just about run its course as the last big thing. So let's talk about IWC, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is an interactive feature, so I wanna hear your perspective. You guys are always great in the live chat. I interact as much as I can. Let me introduce the premise, and then you give me some feedback as I go along, and I'll read through. So IWC, the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
Two years ago, 16-year IWC CEO Georges Kern departed. After being nominated to the board of Richemont, he actually jumped to become a stakeholder and CEO at Breitling, which was recently purchased by CVC Capital Partners of London. Okay, private equity buys out a big brand, brings in a superstar CEO. What happened to IWC? Well, his old charge, the international watch company of Schaffhausen, then entered uncharted territory virtually for the first time since its arrival in the Richemont fold. Richemont bought the company in 2000, Kern was installed in 2001. There's hardly been an IWC under Richemont without George Kern. So what's going well? Guys, you know the obvious. Two really strong model lines. Two years into Christophe Granger Harris, leadership of the brand, the Portuguese and the pilot look really robust. We just passed an unexpectedly recent year of the pilot's watch, the last reboot of the pilot, don't forget, was 2016. And IWC usually reboots one collection each model year. And it usually goes in five, six, seven year cycles. It's unusual to see two reboots in the space of three model years. But that is to say, right now, the pilot line is very fresh. Can they go back to the well forever? I'm not sure. But let's move on from the pilot, which is brand new for this year and selling well by all accounts, and talk about the Portuguese one more time. Because I really think the Portuguese is a rare triumph. And when I say it's a rare triumph, I mean very few watch brands are able to say that one of the pillars of a successful marketing strategy and model line is a dress watch. And that's exactly what the Portuguese is. It's a triumph for the Schaffhausen brand. That right there is reference 3714, and it is the best-selling Portuguese model of all time. Launched in 1998, that is the 40... 0.8 millimeter Portuguese chronograph. And even Rolex, remember, has not figured out how to build sustained momentum behind its dress watch line, the Cellini. And Omega has virtually given up the pure play dress watch push in Western markets. Yes, the Constellation is very successful in the East, and the DeVilles even do okay out there. But at the end of the day, in the West, in North, South America, the Middle East, and Europe, I'm calling all those the West. It's all about Speedmasters and Seamasters. So even Omega and Rolex haven't been able to bust into successful and sustained successful marketing of dress watches. IWC has that going with the Portuguese, and it is a legend. To find dress watch collections as important to their brands as the Portuguese to IWC, you have to look at Patek's Calatravas, FP Journe, which is still mostly a dress watch brand, but again, 900 watches a year, it's almost a rounding error for these super majors, and then a bunch of independents like Dufour and Voodelainen and Acrivia and Long und Heine. Those, again, are rounding errors for the big manufacturers that are making 75,000 to 100,000 pieces a year like IWC. Let's talk about what else is good, more good, a hugely successful 2018 Jubilee collection. Everyone loved almost all of these watches and they sold well. Many of them sold out. The 10 to 12 layer hand finished lacquer dials were a true standout and worthwhile crafterology in price points that often don't feature any hand finishing. The watches themselves were excellent. Due to a late launch after March 2018, the standout tribute to Paul Weber is actually up for one and possibly two big awards at the GPHG this year. It missed out on last year's GPHG because it was late to production, but it's up for the iconic category where I think it's gonna win, and it's got a long shot viability for the Egidor, the big golden needle or golden hand that is the grand prize at the Oscars of watchmaking. That's a hell of a watch for less than a third the price of a Zeitwerk. Now, finally, the 2018 Portuguese chronograph, this is very important, reference 3716, gives us a preview. This is the Jubilee limited edition, manufacture movement, lacquer dial, display case back, but it gives us in-house caliber 69355 for the first time, an in-house caliber in the best-selling watch, which sets up an appealing and logical successor to the 21-year-old 3714 that you saw earlier. That was the best-selling Portuguese of all time, and I have a feeling the 3716 will be right on its heels with an upgraded movement and an upgraded display case back. So, the bad. But first, let's talk about what you guys see coming here. Okay, right here, what do you think is the good about IWC, or the, the bad or the ugly? We have George V saying, 
went to an IWC authorized dealer in Newport Beach. Two salespeople didn't meet or greet anyone, walked in and left. Not a good sign. We've got right here. AH saying, hi everyone, I was trying to ask Tim for, but what do you guys recommend? What size of AP should I look into? Wear well with 40 millimeter Milgauss. You want to look at the 36 millimeter, 38 millimeter, and 39 millimeter Royal Oaks, because anything larger is going to be big if you're used to a 40 millimeter Milgauss. Size down when looking at Royal Oaks. And then right here we have Richard K saying, the Portuguese is a real icon. And then right here we have Sutat saying, indeed, IWC 3717 from the Pilot's Collection, the Pilot Chronograph was amazing. Then they got larger in the 3777 evolution and they lost me. And then we've got Thomas M saying, many IWCs are too thick, need to get their in-house movements thinner. I own the Salita 200 based 3239, 10 millimeters thick, that ingenieur. That's a good point. IWC does need thinner in-house calibers and for that matter, so does Jager LeCoult. It seems to be a common thread throughout the Richemont Group brands. And then right here we have Abdul saying, I think the IWC Paul Weber is a great deal compared to the Longa Zeitwerk. There's a place for both in the world, but I have to agree with you. With that dial and that movement for about 23 grand, I would rather have the IWC. You didn't hear that from me. Then again, you've got me on camera. All right. Jumping in right here, Nick H saying, Tim, great material as always. What do you think about the Tudor Harrods edition as an investment piece? I have it on good authority. They're going to be discontinued next month. One, they're not rare, but down the line, if you buy it pre-owned, I can't see you losing on it if you private sell it. But remember, and this is coming from a pre-owned watch buyer and seller. That's what my company does. That's what pays for these pixels. You will get less if you want to sell quickly and easily to a pre-owned vendor. Private sale, I think you could buy the Tudor Harrod used and probably do all right. I don't think you'll lose service costs and strap replacements accepted. All right, now let's talk a little bit more. Randy Allen asking, what about the engineer? We're going to talk about that. Let's talk about the bad though. First, a lack of faith in the Aquatimer collection. Dive watches in the luxury watch market in the West, that is in North America, South America, Western Europe, in the Middle East. Dive watches are huge. One could even say they are the meat of the market. And it's impossible how a dedicated tool watch brand like IWC with a history, that's the 1967 Aquatimer A12, the first Aquatimer, of significant divers. And that's the early 1980s reference 3500 Porsche Ocean 2000 designed by Porsche Design, built by IWC. But IWC has a real history here, and they are a tool watch brand, and yet they are weak on dive watches. I could see Piaget, Breguet, Longa, Patek Philippe, and Vacheron being weak in dive watches because well, there are basic brand image incompatibility issues there. Not to say they wouldn't love to have them in the collection, but IWC has no excuse for the false starts and lack of momentum behind the Aquatimers. Two thoughts. One, the Aquatimers, as currently offered, are great mechanical engineering products. They are well made. They are solid. They have impressive movements. I would even say the prices are relatively reasonable by Richemont standards, but they're just too darn big and too thick. 44 millimeter chronograph, 17 millimeters thick. No no thank you. Start with that problem and then work in board. Okay, let's also talk about confidence in the model line. IWC redesigns one model line every year. There's the year of the pilot's watch. 2017 was even the year of the Da Vinci. This is the year of the pilot's watch. 2015 was the year of the Portuguese. And 2014 was the last year of the Aquatimer. I have it on good authority that this year was going to be the year of the Aquatimer. IWC looked back at the Da Vinci debacle of 2017 and said, our Aquatimer is not strong enough to carry an entire model year of new product by itself. So they relaunched the Pilot's Watch collection for the second time in three model years. I don't know when the Aquatimer is going to be refreshed, but we already know the watches are too big, there's not enough interest, they're not well promoted, and IWC has confidence issues marketing dive watches. Let's talk about another bad, not the ugly, but bad. Too many model lines to understand. Fortunately, although there are too many model lines to grasp intuitively, IWC offers an introduction to the collections. Well, thank God for that, but that's admission of a problem. It should be self-explanatory. Rolex gives you classic and utilitarian timepieces. You get professional and classic, two categories that lead you to the various models. That's a better start than offering a huge range of bewildering watches, some of which look rather similar. Now, the Portofino and the Da Vinci collections that nobody at IWC quite understands how to market. 
But let's talk about some of the issues here. On paper, IWC has three dress watch collections with that, Portofino, and the Portuguese. And two of them are buried under the Portuguese. Care to guess which two? Obvious stuff here. But because the prices and the positioning and the marketing are all fairly similar, overlapping, and a bit redundant and confusing, it's almost like asking an Italian car enthusiast to choose between a Ferrari, a Maserati, and an Alfa Romeo when they're all in the same showroom at the same dealer and priced similarly. If you're getting what a Ferrari is in the real world, there's no way you're going Alfa or Maserati, especially when you're looking at watches like this that do create that exact same problem. The Portuguese is the Ferrari of IWC's dress watch range, and the Da Vinci and the Portofino fight over who's going to be the launch of the Alfa Romeo, the Maserati. And I'm not sure if even any of them get quite as far as being the Maserati. Really, these watches need to have much smaller defined roles. Maybe, as you could see, the Da Vinci, which is almost exclusively pitched as a unisex or ladies option, just needs to become the ladies collection. And then we need to decide that the Portofino collection, the Portofino collection, which draws its style and reason for existence from a 1980s giant Portofino model that only a few enthusiasts remember, maybe this needs to be a very occasional type thing where there will be one very limited edition exclusive and prestigious Portofino novelty each year rather than a full line that has a chronograph and complications and automatics and perpetual calendar. I mean, once you start mixing all of that stuff up in the Da Vinci and Portofino collections, I really just ask, if you're a general public guy shopping IWC, why not just get the Portuguese? It's going to do the best on resale. It's going to be the most recognizable. And if you want the IWC Schaffhausen dress watch experience, I really couldn't make the case that you should pick a Da Vinci or a Portofino over a Portuguese. Let's take a look at what you guys are saying. James G. Arthur, IWC have been stale for the past five years, but I've had some nice releases of late in my personal view, especially with the Jubilees, that's definitely been the case, and the pilots this year were on point. Right here, we have a comment from Abdul saying, IWC really needs to trim down the collection. Size and they need to size down and upsell their watches. And I would agree with that too. Right here, we have the Provincial Gentry saying that Da Vinci is not for him. And then we have JP Melb saying Portofinos are rather pointless, I agree. Again, unless it's a very niche thing, like once a year for the IWC Collectors Forum, that kind of IWC buyer is into the Portofino. There shouldn't be so many size and price and complication overlaps with the Portuguese. And then right here, we have Richard K saying, the Portofino collection is confused like a presidential candidate. Point taken. Jumping back into the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think there's an issue with IWC having to mandate a full line. Why do we have $4,100 Mark 18s, and million dollar Sidereal Scafusia. That creates huge overlap with almost every other Richemont brand from Vacheron Constantin to Bauman Mercier. Please, IWC, focus on the middle of the market, say $5,000 to, oh, let's go crazy, $100,000. Make that your game. Focus on sports watches, revitalize the dive watches, and make the Portuguese your only mainline dress watch offering. Now the ugly, and here's where things get a little, a little bearish. I don't want to be down on IWC because the company has done pretty well under Christophe Granger hair. For a first three years, he's doing well. And I have to say that all things considered, it's hardly the most troubled Richemont brand. But let's start with the ugly decision to drop the Gerald Genta Ingenieur design starting in 2016. In a market phase, our moment right now, saturated with Genta emulators and wannabes, IWC had the real thing until about two and a half years ago when they phased out the Genta Ingenieur design. Think about all the wannabes from Chopard to Oris to Bell and Ross, everyone. I mean, Piaget with the Polo S. Think about all the emulators that wish to God they had an original 1970s Genta design that they have owned since inception. And IWC had that, and they discontinued it in favor of an ingenieur line that was kind of redrawn in the style of the 1950s reference 666 AD, which is a wonderful nod to history, but the absolute worst read on where the market was going that they could have made quickly 
bring back the traditional Genta Ingenieur. The 3227 was great, make that again. Uh, I think the 3239 could be brought back, no issues there. The problem is that IWC had gold in stainless steel. Yes, they're one and the same these days, and decided to throw it in the bin. So that was pretty ugly. It's not too late, IWC, for a recovery, by the way. A huge miscalculation and abdication of their own real history. Overproduction, I think 75,000 to 100,000 watches a year is too many. When you consider the Da Vinci, the Portofino lines, the Aquatimers that they can't sell, and some of the more peripheral pieces in the pilot and Portuguese collections, you could really pare down. You could reduce the Ingenieur to just a few well-chosen integrated bracelet sports watch designs rather than a full line. And you could probably reduce the number of watches made, increase the transaction prices at dealers, cut back on the gray market, and raise the standing of the brand. Right now, Patek Philippe is begged to make more watches. That's where you want to be when you're selling steel sports watches. Clients who are waiting and eager to wait. That's the game plan. IWC, it's not simple in concept. I'll admit, it's hard in practice. And finally, too many rivals in-house at Richemont. Let's take a look, guys. This is an IWC's fault. They were bought into this world. But right now, it's symptomatic of our era. All of the big groups, except maybe caring, are just like this. It's hard not to see IWC product overlap with JLC, Panerai, Cartier, and even Baum and Mercier at the low end. So clean it up, coordinate with the other brands. This may have to be done at the Richemont corporate level, but the first question you need to ask is, do all of our products represent the best Richemont products in their class? If the answer is no or you're not sure, it's time to redesign or call the collection. Finally, too much noise, too many watches, indistinct ownership of product classes, price ranges, and target customers. Figure out what you make, your heart and soul. Figure out what sets you apart from the other Richemont brands, how many watches you can sell at list price, and then ultimately exactly who your customer is. And I think IWC will be all right. Jumping into the box right here, we have, bum, 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 bum. we have Hoy Wynn saying, IWC pilot lines seem split between their more modern pilot and the classic Spitfire. Too many Many lines, IWC trying to be Omega. And then right here we have Jeffrey B saying IWC GST annual perpetual, or I guess he's saying the GST perpetual calendar chronograph is still the best bang for your buck and an awesome style and amazing bracelet. Tim, what can compare in that price range? Probably nothing to be honest, except maybe the mid 2000s Ulysse Nordin marine annual calendar chronograph. That would be my rival because it's also swimmable, a complex calendar and a chronograph. Jumping back into the program, your pictures are worth a thousand of my words. Viewer wrist chats. Okay, Abbas shares his new limited edition Tudor Black Bay chronograph all black in honor of New Zealand sports. Ali B and his Tudor Black Bay chill for a quiet moment. JW Dean is Brigade Marine or contenders for best composed photo of the day. Nicely done, man. And Carmine D and his third generation Dodge Viper SRT10 Sport, the latest Royal Oak chronograph 38 millimeter hot from SIH 2019. Send your shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. Comment and subscribe below as always. Join me. Follow me. Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Help me hit 30k in 2k19. And as always, I will do my best to respond to all your comments. Details of our new Singapore office in the description. Time out. Tim out. Thanks to you. Thanks to my crew. And time, well, thanks for logging on. Time to go.